The Arch of the Barnard Loop is one of the most fascinating places. From the ghostly pale gases of the Witch Head, past the bright stellar nursery of the Orion Nebula, across the Horse Head and the Flame, and into the faint wisp of the Orion Belt Cluster, and then finally, just on from there, Messier 78, also known as, oddly enough, the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. And it is a challenging target to shoot, at magnitude 8 it is very dim. But the effort, oh, the effort is worth it, because I am utterly convinced Nebula M78 is one of the most beautiful objects in the night sky. But, by and large, this structure is a reflection nebula, which means it emits many colors and is best captured in broadband. And that means, to really record this nebula properly, you need truly dark skies. And yet, to really make its colors, its beauty pop, you also need some narrowband data. I caught some of this data a month ago, when, during a night of a 50% full moon, I targeted the telescope at the M78 nebula and captured that initial narrowband data. And I have been waiting for a month for a perfect night, a truly dark night, in which I could task the Sky Story Observatory for the entire 13 hours of night we are presently getting at this latitude on observing the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. The top is open, the telescope is configured and oriented, and the weather report says soon those high-flying clouds will vanish. At this point, there is nothing to do but endure the ticking of the clock and eagerly await the setting of the sun. I have PhD2 guiding about 20 minutes before I start imaging, and a NINA sequence configured specifically for a dim deep sky object has been pre-programmed. As soon as the sky became dark and the last cloud flew from one horizon to the other, the imaging began, with a goal of catching 120 300 second images throughout the night. On the Player One Uranus C camera, I had the gain set to 250 and the offset set to 10. A test exposure revealed that these settings would catch the wide range of detail without blowing out the brighter regions. It is important always to expose for the brightest regions. Digital cameras are very good at bringing up shadow, but they don't do so well if you blow out the brights. If you are imaging a target and the dynamic range is too high to handle this, make two sets of exposures and calibrate the next set for the middle range of brightness. Your goal should be to preserve data both in the brightest areas and in the darkest areas. Later on in processing, these two data sets can be integrated to show the brightest and the darkest areas. Your goal should be to reveal the full range of information from the brightest to the darkest points. The M78 Nebula has a wide range between bright and dark points, but it is not so bright that a single exposure cannot capture the full range. It's just important to expose for the brighter regions. The real challenge with this nebula is that, because it is a reflection nebula, it's reflecting starlight, which means that it's reflecting all the different colors. Because stars themselves are broadband emitters, you're going to have to use a luminance filter or a UVIR cutoff filter to catch the full range of color and beauty of this nebula. There's no reason you couldn't capture the nebula with narrowband, but my attempts have always left something wanting. I really feel with these types of targets that you need broadband to fully develop their beauty. And that means you need something that is sadly in this world becoming increasingly hard to find, truly dark skies. However, here at the Sky Story Observatory, we have dark skies in abundance. And beneath these dark skies, the M78 Nebula is glorious. Let's take a look at how to go about developing such an image. Even though the M78 Nebula is a broadband target, experience has repeatedly taught me that you get the sharpest, crispest images with the most popping colors if you combine broadband data with narrow or dual band. So, on the left here, we have a night's worth of dual band data of M78, the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula, and on the right, we have a full night's worth of broadband. These are separately stacked masters. Each one has been stacked using PixInsight's weighted batch processing script and using calibration frames specific to the filter that was used. On the left, the calibration frames were for the ZWO dual band filter, and on the right, the calibration frames were for an IRUV filter. 
The first thing we're going to do is image solve to show the color calibration tool where this data is in the sky. And then we're going to run the spectrophotometric color calibration tool. That's a mouthful, isn't it? To get the proper color balance on each image. In the dual band image, there's just too much green noise. And so the spectrophotometric color calibration tool will not work until SCNR is run. We'll run it, that'll clear up the image some, and then the tool can work just fine. On the right, in the broadband data, the spectrophotometric color calibration tool works just fine. I cloned the image and ran SCNR on the clone, but as often happens when the spectrophotometric color calibration tool does work, running SCNR later just imbalances the color. So the clone with the SCNR change was discarded. Now we have two color balance sets of masters that need to be integrated. We'll use the image integration tool for that. But we're going to run a simple experiment in the process of this development too. You see, on some astrophotography forums, persons say that you should run color calibration and then integrate. In other astrophotography forums, persons say that you don't need dual or narrow band data for a broadband subject anyway, that it doesn't help. And yet another camp says that you should run your color calibrations SCNR, and then denoise and deblur before integrating. Now, in my experience, a lot of the, we'll call it the doctrine of astrophotography that I've heard, turns out to be right, but a fair bit of it also turns out to be wrong. So we're going to test each of those theories. We'll color calibrate and integrate the masters. Then we'll use RC Astro software to denoise and deblur the calibrated masters and integrate them. And then we're going to denoise and deblur the broadband data only. And then finally, we're going to develop all of those images by modifying their histograms and curves. So the various integrations are about completed. And what we're going to do now is run histogram transformations and curves on each of them. I'm going to use the same histogram and curve techniques on each image, but I won't be using the exact same processes. I'm going to attempt to develop each image to bring out its individual best. In the course of that, I'm going to show you how to do the best possible histogram transformation. It only takes 30 seconds or less. And the reason I'm doing this is that many of us are aware that a beloved automatic histogram transformation script recently vanished from PixInsight during a recent update. This is no criticism against the maker. He had produced it for a long time, and every time PixInsight was updated, he had to modify it. And he eventually wanted to move on to other things. I understand that. But a lot of us liked it and loved it, and I found it to be one of the best and quickest histogram modification tools. However, it does not take long to modify a histogram, and I can show you how to do it perfectly every single time in about 30 seconds. So with the final image that we're going to experiment with done processing, that is done doing its denoising and deblurring, let's fix some histograms. This is the integration that was made by color balancing the dual band and broadband masters, and then running blur exterminator and noise exterminator on each of them. We'll start out by removing the screen transfer functions working stretch, and then open up the histogram transformation tool. Then we're going to create a preview window and select the correct histogram to view from the dropdown list. Once we have the correct histogram view selected, working in the widest possible view, we're going to move the black point up to just below the lowest point of the left side of the histogram curve. And then we're going to move the middle tab to just above the right side of the histogram curve. Then we're going to zoom in the view to somewhere between 100 and 150 here. How much you would zoom in will depend on the image. This is a fairly narrow histogram curve, so 100 to 150. And once zoomed in, we're gonna move the leftmost point, which is the black point, to just below the histogram curve and then the middle point to just above the highest point of the histogram curve. We want to be very careful to watch for any red, blue, or green marks in the histogram because that's data. We do not want to cut off any data whatsoever. Going about things this way will give you a dimmer image in the preview window than you might get using an automated histogram stretching tool, but that's perfectly okay because you can very finely modify that using the curves tool. The Curves tool itself is fundamentally a histogram stretching tool, but it allows you to work in very refined ways. You can stretch only the luminance channel, the alpha channel, or any of the individual color channels or saturation altogether or saturation with luminance. 
making the Curves tool the definitively most powerful tool available in PixInsights and really any photo editor. Master Curves, and all by itself, it can do almost anything. And with our histogram resolved, we're just going to apply the process to the image, and already the image looks pretty good. Now, using this exact same methodology, I'm going to modify the histograms of each of our other final masters. So let's skip on ahead. We're now going to modify the curves for each of our test images. You can start by modifying luminance or color. It doesn't matter much. If you don't like the outcome, you can always go back and correct. In this case, because there is such a wide dynamic range in these images, I'm starting out with luminance, however. I want to protect the brightest areas from becoming blown out, so I'm going to drag the upper part of the curve down just a little, just so I can see the detail, the gases and the stars, within the, shall we call them, the eyes of the nebula. Then I'm going to raise the mid-range tones to bring up their visibility, and then slightly lower the lower part of the luminance curve to darken the space between the stars. Now the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula is quite colorful as nebulae go, and I don't want to change its natural color, so I'm simply going to run a C-curve on the saturation bar to enhance those natural colors. And my goal is to bring the colors out, to develop them and have them pop a little without oversaturating the image. Oversaturation is a very common problem in modern imagery. And I get the appeal, the draw of it is it's eye-catching. Persons look at it, and in the first instant they look at a hypersaturated image, they go, wow, that's colorful. But then very quickly, one realizes it's not realistic, and it loses that appeal. We want to bring out the natural colors, have them be eye-catching, have them pop, but avoid the mistake of overdoing them. Once I've made a basic C-curve of general saturation to increase the overall saturation of the image, I'll then modify the shape of the curve to darken the reds and the lower tones a little bit. There's a lot of red in the left half of this image, and if I just do a straight smooth C curve, that red will tend to be a little oversaturated. And when that's done, I'll make some adjustments to the individual color channels to further saturate some of the oranges, thereby enhancing the sense of fire within the absorption nebulae, balance the bluish white of the eyes of the nebula, and bring out the faint trace gases in the stars upper right and lower right in the image. Finally, when I have this curve run just the way I want it, I'll apply the process, then reset the curves tool, and then make more delicate adjustments to color and luminance. I might do this two or three more times before I'm done. Thinking of it as each time applying a delicate but crucial layer of adjustment to the image to ultimately bring out a final perfect balance of light, shadow, and color. The process eventually leaves us with three finished masters. Above left is the broadband only data. Above right is the integration of dual and narrow band data prior to the blur and noise exterminators being run. Lower center is the integration of the dual band and broadband data made after the blur and noise exterminators had been run. The broadband data by itself, while not bad, is listless. The colors do not really pop and the sharpness is not what we would want to see. And all by itself, the broadband data does not yield the best result, and I have found this to be the case consistently with every broadband target I have imaged. For the best results, combine broadband data with either narrowband or dual, triple, or quadband data. The two images on the right combine the dual band and broadband data. Both are sharper and the colors pop more. And I think at first glance, the lower image is the one that appears to win. It seems to be the sharpest and has the most eye-catching color. But if one zooms in, and you don't have to pixel peep, if you just zoom in a little, you can see this data is overcooked. There's too fast a transition between the brights and the darks. And the colors, also overcooked, do not represent the true coloration of the nebula. I want a true color representation, so the lower image simply will not do. That's the one that was integrated from the dual band and the broadband masters after the noise exterminator and blow exterminators had been run. So, the winner is the upper right image. The integration of the dual band and broadband data before noise and blur exterminator are run. They were still run on it just after the integration. It is on this image that I'll apply the final layers of curves adjustment, making some very subtle changes on the luminance channel to slightly bring down the brightness in those eyes and show the stars within better, as well as the ripples and streaks of the gases within the eyes. 
that curve is applied, and then another curve is run emphasizing the middle and lower brightness ranges to catch more of that detail. And then one final color adjustment curve is run. A slight modification to the S channel, the saturation channel, to increase the colors a bit, and a few more slight modifications to the individual color channels to amplify the sense of flaming stars within the absorption nebulae and overall enrich the vibrance of the natural colors in this nebula. And then at last, we get the final result. M78, the strangely named Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula, with which its appearance of eyes is one of the eeriest nebulae I know of. However, this nebula is also my absolute favorite. Of all the images of all the astronomical objects I have shot, this nebula is the one I like the most. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed.